Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 7 An outward-bound mail-boat had come in that afternoon, and the big dining-room of the hotel was more than half full of people, with a hundred-pound round-the-world tickets in their pockets. There were married couples looking domesticated and bored with each other in the midst of their travels. There were small parties and large parties, and lone individuals dining solemnly or feasting boisterously, but all thinking, conversing, joking, or scowling, as was their wont at home, and just as intelligently receptive of new impressions as their trunks upstairs. Henceforth they would be labelled as having passed through this and that place, and so would their luggage. They would cherish this distinction of their persons, and preserve the gum tickets on their portmanteaus as documentary evidence, as the only permanent trace of their improving enterprise. The dark-faced servants tripped without noise over the vast and polished floor. Now and then a girl's laugh would be heard, as innocent and empty as her mind, or, in a sudden hush of crockery, a few words in an affected drawl from some wit embroidering for the benefit of a grinning tableful the last funny story of shipboard scandal. Two nomadic old maids, dressed up to kill, worked acrimoniously through the bill of fare, whispering to each other with faded lips, wooden-faced and bizarre, like two sumptuous scarecrows. A little wine opened Jim's heart and loosened his tongue. His appetite was good, too, I noticed. He seemed to have buried somewhere the opening episode of our acquaintance. It was like a thing of which there would be no more question in this world. And all the time I had before me these blue, boyish eyes looking straight into mine, this young face, these capable shoulders, the open bronzed forehead with a white line under the roots of clustering fair hair, this appearance appealing at sight to all my sympathies, this frank aspect, the artless smile, the youthful seriousness. He was of the right sort. He was one of us. He talked soberly with a sort of composed unreserve, and with a quiet bearing that might have been the outcome of manly self-control, of impudence, of callousness, of a colossal unconsciousness, of a gigantic deception. <laughs> Who can tell? From our tone we might have been discussing a third person, a football match, last year's weather. My mind floated in a sea of conjectures till the turn of the conversation enabled me, without being offensive, to remark that upon the whole this inquiry must have been pretty trying to him. He darted his arm across the tablecloth, and clutching my hand by the side of my plate, glared fixedly. I was startled. "'It must be awfully hard,' I stammered, confused by this display of speechless feeling. "'It is hell!' he burst out in a muffled voice. This movement and these words caused two well-groomed male globe-trotters at a neighboring table to look up in alarm from their iced pudding. I rose, and we passed into the front gallery for coffee and cigars. On little octagon tables candles burned in glass globes. Clumps of stiff-leaved plants separated sets of cozy wicker chairs, and between the pairs of columns, whose reddish shafts caught in a long row the sheen from the tall windows, the night, glittering and somber, seemed to hang like a splendid drapery. The riding lights of ships winked afar like setting stars, and the hills across the roadstead resembled rounded black masses of arrested thunderclouds. "'I couldn't clear out,' Jim began. "'The skipper did. That's all very well for him. I couldn't, and I wouldn't. They all got out of it in one way or another. But it wouldn't do for me.' I listened with concentrated attention, not daring to stir in my chair, I wanted to know, and to this day I don't know, I can only guess. He would be confident and depressed all in the same breath, as if some conviction of innate blamelessness had checked the truth writhing within him at every turn. 
He began by saying, in the tone in which a man would admit his inability to jump a twenty-foot wall, that he could never go home now. And this declaration recalled to my mind what Briarly had said, that the old parson in Essex seemed to fancy his sailor son not a little. I can't tell you whether Jim knew he was especially fancied, but the tone of his references to my dad was calculated to give me a notion that the good old rural dean was about the finest man that had ever been worried by the cares of a large family since the beginning of the world. This, though never stated, was implied with an anxiety that there should be no mistake about it, which was really very true and charming, but added a poignant sense of lives far off to the other elements of the story. "'He has seen it all in the home papers by this time,' said Jim. "'I can never face the poor old chap.' I did not dare to lift my eyes at this till I heard him add, "'I could never explain. He wouldn't understand.' Then I looked up. He was smoking reflectively, and, after a moment, rousing himself, began to talk again. He discovered at once a desire that I should not confound him with his partners in, uh, in crime, let us call it. He was not one of them. He was altogether of another sort. I gave no sign of dissent. I had no intention, for the sake of barren truth, to rob him of the smallest particle of any saving grace that would come in his way. I didn't know how much of it he believed himself. I didn't know what he was playing up to, if he was playing up to anything at all, and I suspect he did not know either, for it is my belief that no man ever understands quite his own artful dodges to escape from the grim shadow of self-knowledge. I made no sound all the time he was wondering what he had better do after that stupid inquiry was over. Apparently he shared Briarly's contemptuous opinion of these proceedings ordained by law. He would not know where to turn, he confessed, clearly thinking aloud rather than talking to me. Certificate gone, career broken, no money to get away, no work that he could obtain, as far as he could see. At home he could perhaps get something, but it meant going to his people for help, and that he would not do. He saw nothing for it but ship before the mast, could perhaps get a quartermaster's billet in some steamer, would do for a quartermaster. "'Do you think you would?' I asked pitilessly. He jumped up, and, going to the stone balustrade, looked out into the night. In a moment he was back, towering above my chair, with his youthful face clouded yet by the pain of a conquered emotion." He had understood very well that I did not doubt his ability to steer a ship. In a voice that quavered a bit, he asked me why did I say that. I had been no end kind to him. I had not even laughed at him when— Here he began to mumble. That mistake, you know, made a confounded ass of myself. I broke in by saying rather warmly that for me such a mistake was not a matter to laugh at. He sat down and drank deliberately some coffee, emptying the small cup to the last drop. "'That does not mean I admit for a moment the cap fitted,' he declared distinctly. "'No,' I said. "'No,' he affirmed with quiet decision. "'Do you know what you would have done? Do you? And you don't think yourself—' he gulped something— you don't think yourself a... a cur? And with this, upon my honour, he looked at me inquisitively. It was a question, it appears, a bona fide question. However, he did not wait for an answer. Before I could recover, he went on, with his eyes straight before him, as if reading off something written on the body of the night. It is all in being ready. I wasn't. Not, not then. I don't want to excuse myself, but I would like to explain. I would like somebody to understand. Somebody, one person at least. You. Why not you? It was solemn, and a little ridiculous, too, as they always are, those struggles of an individual trying to save from the fire 
his idea of what his moral identity should be, this precious notion of a convention, only one of the rules of the game, nothing more, but all the same so terribly effective by its assumption of unlimited power over natural instincts, by the awful penalties of its failure. He began his story quietly enough. On board that Dale Line steamer that had picked up those four floating in a boat upon the discreet sunset glow of the sea, they had been after the first day looked askance upon. The fat skipper told some story, the others had been silent, and at first it had been accepted. You don't cross-examine poor castaways you had the good luck to save, if not from cruel death, then at least from cruel suffering. Afterward, with time to think it over, it might have struck the officers of the Avondale that there was something fishy in the affair. But, of course, they would keep their doubts to themselves. They had picked up the captain, the mate, and two engineers of the steamer Patna sunk at sea, and that, very properly, was enough for them. I did not ask Jim about the nature of his feelings during the ten days he spent on board. From the way he narrated that part, I was at liberty to infer he was partly stunned by the discovery he had made, the discovery about himself, and no doubt was at work trying to explain it away to the only man who was capable of appreciating all its tremendous magnitude. You must understand he did not try to minimize its importance, of that I am sure, and therein lies his distinction. As to what sensations he experienced when he got ashore and heard the unforeseen conclusion of the tale in which he had taken such a pitiful part, he told me nothing of them, and it is difficult to imagine. I wonder whether he felt the ground cut from under his feet. I wonder. But no doubt he managed to get a fresh foothold very soon. He was ashore a whole fortnight waiting in the sailor's home, and as there were six or seven men staying there at the time, I had heard of him a little. Their languid opinion seemed to be that in addition to his other shortcomings he was a sulky brute. He had passed these days on the veranda, buried in a long chair, and coming out of his place of sepulture only at meal-times or late at night, when he wandered on the quays all by himself, detached from his surroundings, irresolute and silent, like a ghost without a home to haunt. "'I don't think I've spoken three words to a living soul in all that time,' he said, making me very sorry for him. And directly he added, "'One of these fellows would have been sure to blurt out something I had made up my mind not to put up with, and I didn't want a row. No, not then. I was too—too—I too, had no heart for it. "'So that bulkhead held out after all,' I remarked cheerfully. "'Yes,' he murmured, "'it held. "'And yet I swear to you I felt it bulge under my hand. "'It's extraordinary what strains old iron will stand sometimes,' I said. "'Thrown back in his seat, his legs stiffly out and arms hanging down, "'he nodded slightly several times. "'You could not conceive a sadder spectacle.' Suddenly he lifted his head, he sat up, he slapped his thigh. Oh, what a chance missed! My God, what a chance missed! he blazed out. But the ring of the last missed resembled a cry wrung out by pain. He was silent again, with a still faraway look of fierce yearning after that missed distinction with his nostrils for an instant dilated, sniffing the intoxicating breath of that wasted opportunity. If you think I was either surprised or shocked, you do me an injustice in more ways than one. Ah, he was an imaginative beggar. He would give himself away. He would give himself up. I could see in his glance, darted into the night, all his inner being, carried on, projected headlong into the fanciful realm of recklessly heroic aspirations. He had no leisure to regret what he had lost. He was so wholly and naturally concerned for what he had failed to obtain. He was very far away from me, who watched him across three feet of space. 
with every instant he was penetrating deeper into the impossible world of romantic achievements. He got to the heart of it at last. A strange look of beatitude overspread his features. His eyes sparkled in the light of the candle burning between us. He positively smiled. He had penetrated to the very heart, to the very heart. It was an ecstatic smile that your faces, or mine either, will never wear, my dear boys. I whisked him back by saying, "'If you had stuck to the ship, you mean.' He turned upon me, his eyes suddenly amazed and full of pain, with a bewildered, startled, suffering face, as though he had tumbled down from a star. Neither you nor I will ever look like this on any man. He shuddered profoundly, as if a cold fingertip had touched his heart. Last of all, he sighed. I was not in a merciful mood. He provoked one by his contradictory indiscretions. It is unfortunate you didn't know beforehand, I said, with every unkind intention, but the perfidious shaft fell harmless dropped at his feet like a spent arrow, as it were, and he did not think of picking it up. Perhaps he had not even seen it. Presently, lolling at ease, he said, "'Dash it all, I tell you it bulged. I was holding my lamp along the angle-iron in the lower deck when a flake of rust as big as the palm of my hand fell off the plate, all of itself.' He passed his hand over his forehead. The thing stirred and jumped off like something alive while I was looking at it. That made you feel pretty bad, I observed casually. Do you suppose, he said, that I was thinking of myself, with a hundred and sixty people at my back, all fast asleep in that four-tween deck alone, and more of them aft, more on the deck, sleeping, knowing nothing about it, three times as many as there were boats for, even if there had been time? I expected to see the iron open out as I stood there, and the rush of water going over them as they lay. What could I do? What? I can easily picture him to myself in the peopled gloom of the cavernous place, with the light of the globe-lamp falling on a small portion of the bulkhead that had the weight of the ocean on the other side, and the breathing of unconscious sleepers in his ears. I can see him glaring at the iron startled by the falling rust, overburdened by the knowledge of an imminent death. This, I gathered, was the second time he had been sent forward by that skipper of his, who, I rather think, wanted to keep him away from the bridge. He told me that his first impulse was to shout, and straightway make all those people leap out of sleep into terror. But such an overwhelming sense of his helplessness came over him that he was not able to produce a sound. This is, I suppose, what people mean by the tongue cleaving to the roof of the mouth. "'Too dry,' was the concise expression he used in reference to this state. Without a sound, then, he scrambled out on deck through the number one hatch. A windsail down there swung against him accidentally, and he remembered that the light touch of the canvas on his face nearly knocked him off the hatchway ladder. He confessed that his knees wobbled a good deal as he stood on the foredeck, looking at another sleeping crowd. The engines having been stopped by that time, the steam was blowing off. Its deep rumble made the whole night vibrate like a bass string. The ship trembled to it. He saw here and there a head lifted off a mat, a vague form uprise in sitting posture, listen sleepily for a moment sink down again into the billowy confusion of boxes, steam winches, ventilators. He was aware all these people did not know enough to take intelligent notice of that strange noise. The ship of iron, the men with white faces, all the sights, all the sounds, everything on board to that ignorant and pious multitude was strange alike, and as trustworthy as it would forever remain incomprehensible. It occurred to him that the fact was fortunate— the idea of it was simply terrible. You must remember he believed, as any other man would have done in his place, that the ship would go down at any moment. The bulging, rust-eaten plates that kept back the ocean fatally must give way, all at once like an undermined dam, and let in a sudden and overwhelming flood. 
He stood looking at these recumbent bodies, a doomed man aware of his fate, surveying the silent company of the dead. They were dead. Nothing could save them. There were boats enough for half of them, perhaps, but there was no time. No time. No time. It did not seem worth while to open his lips, to stir hand or foot. Before he could shout three words or make three steps, he would be floundering in a sea, whitened awfully by the desperate struggles of human beings, clamorous with the distress of cries for help. There was no help. He imagined what would happen perfectly. He went through it all motionless by the hatchway, with the lamp in his hand. He went through it to the very last harrowing detail. I think he went through it again while he was telling me these things. He could not tell the court. I saw as clearly as I see you now that there was nothing I could do. It, it seemed to take all the life out of my limbs. I thought I might just as well stand where I was and wait. I did not think I had many seconds. Suddenly the steam ceased blowing off. The noise, he remarked, had been distracting, but the silence at once became intolerably oppressive. I thought I would choke before I got drowned he said. He protested he did not think of saving himself. The only distinct thought formed, vanishing and reforming in his brain was, eight hundred people and seven boats. Eight hundred people and seven boats. Somebody was speaking aloud inside my head, he said a little wildly. Eight hundred people and seven boats, and no time. Just think of it. He leaned toward me across the little table, and I tried to avoid his stare. "'Do you think I was afraid of death?' he asked in a voice very fierce and low. He brought down his open hand with a bang that made the coffee-cups dance. "'I am ready to swear I was not! I was not! By God, no!' He hitched himself upright and crossed his arms. His chin fell on his breast. The soft clashes of crockery reached us faintly through the high windows. There was a burst of voices, and several men came out in high good humor into the gallery. They were exchanging jocular reminiscences of the donkeys in Cairo. A pale, anxious youth stepping softly on long legs was being chaffed by a strutting and rubicund globe-trotter about his purchases in the bazaar. "'No, really, do you think I've been done to that extent?' he inquired, very earnest and deliberate. The band moved away, dropping into chairs as they went. Matches flared, illuminating for a second faces without the ghost of an expression, and the flat glaze of white shirt-fronts. The hum of many conversations, animated with the ardor of feasting, sounded to me absurd and infinitely remote.' "'Some of the crew were sleeping on the number one hatch within reach of my arm,' began Jim again. "'You must know they kept Kalashi watch in that ship, all hands sleeping through the night, and only the reliefs of quartermasters and lookout men being called. He was tempted to grip and shake the shoulder of the nearest Lascar, but he didn't. Something held his arms down along his sides. He was not afraid, oh, no. Only he just couldn't.' That's all. He was not afraid of death, perhaps. But I'll tell you what, he was afraid of the emergency. His confounded imagination had evoked for him all the horrors of panic, the trampling rush, the pitiful screams, boats swamped, all the appalling incidents of a disaster at sea he had ever heard of. He might have been resigned to die, but I suspect he wanted to die without the added terrors, quietly, in a sort of peaceful trance. A certain readiness to perish is not so very rare, but it is seldom you meet men whose souls, steeled in the impenetrable armor of resolution, are ready to fight a losing battle to the last. The desire of peace waxes stronger as hope declines, till at last it conquers the very desire of life. Which of us here has not observed this, or maybe experienced something of that feeling in his own person? this extreme weariness of emotions, the vanity of effort, the yearning for rest. Those striving with unreasonable forces know it well, the shipwrecked castaways in boats, wanderers lost in a desert, 
men battling against the unthinking might of nature or the stupid brutality of crowds. End of chapter 7 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 8 how long he stood stock still by the hatch, expecting every moment to feel the ship dip under his feet and the rush of water take him at the back and toss him like a chip, I cannot say. Not very long. Two minutes, perhaps. A couple of men he could not make out began to converse drowsily, and also, he could not tell where, he detected a curious noise of shuffling feet. Above these faint sounds there was that awful stillness preceding a catastrophe, that trying silence of the moment before the crash. Then it came into his head that perhaps he would have time to rush along and cut all the lanyards of the gripes, so that the boats would float as the ship went down. The Patna had a long bridge, and all the boats were up there, four on one side and three on the other, the smallest of them on the port side, and nearly abreast of the steering gear. He assured me, with evident anxiety to be believed, that he had been most careful to keep them ready for instant service. He knew his duty. I dare say he was a good enough mate, as far as that went. "'I always believed in being prepared for the worst,' he commented, staring anxiously in my face. I nodded my approval of the sound principle— averting my eyes before the subtle unsoundness of the man. He started unsteadily to run. He had to step over legs, avoid stumbling against the heads. Suddenly someone caught hold of his coat from below, and a distressed voice spoke under his elbow. The light of the lamp he carried in his right hand fell upon an upturned dark face, whose eyes entreated him together with the voice— he had picked up enough of the language to understand the word water, repeated several times in a tone of insistence, of prayer, almost of despair. He gave a jerk to get away, felt an arm embrace his leg. The beggar clung to me like a drowning man, he said impressively. Water! Water! What water did he mean? What did he know? As calmly as I could, I ordered him to let go. He was stopping me. Time was pressing. Other men began to stir. I wanted time, time to cut the boats adrift. He got hold of my hand now, and I felt that he would begin to shout. It flashed upon me it was enough to start a panic, and I hauled off with my free arm and slung the lamp in his face. The glass jingled, the light went out, but the blow made him let go, and I ran off. I wanted to get the boats. I wanted to get at the boats. He leaped after me from behind. I turned on him. He would not keep quiet. He tried to shout. I had half throttled him before I made out what he wanted. He wanted some water. Water to drink. They were on a strict allowance, you know, and he had had with him a young boy I had noticed several times. His child was sick and thirsty. He had caught sight of me as I passed by, and was begging for a little water. That's all. We were under the bridge in the dark. He kept on snatching at my wrists. There was no getting rid of him. I dashed into my berth, grabbed my water bottle, and thrust it into his hands. He vanished. I didn't find out till then how much I was in want of a drink myself. He leaned on one elbow with a hand over his eyes. I felt a creepy sensation all down my backbone. There was something peculiar in all this. The fingers of the hand that shaded his brow trembled slightly. He broke the short silence. These things happen only once to a man, and— Ah, well. When I got on the bridge at last, the beggars were getting one of the boats off the chocks. A boat! I was running up the ladder when a heavy blow fell on my shoulder, just missing my head. It didn't stop me, and the chief engineer, they had got him out of his bunk by then, raised the boat stretcher again. Somehow I had no mind to be surprised at anything. All this seemed natural and awful, and awful. I dodged that miserable maniac, lifted him off the deck as though he'd been a little child. 
and he started whispering in my arms. Don't, don't. I thought you was one of them niggers. I flung him away. He skidded along the bridge, and knocked the legs from under the little chap, the, the second. The skipper, busy about the boat, looked round and came at me head down, growling like a wild beast. I flinched no more than a stone. I was as solid standing there as this. He tapped lightly with his knuckles at the wall beside his chair. It was as though I had heard it all, seen it all, gone through it all twenty times already. I wasn't afraid of them. I drew back my fist, and he stopped short, muttering, Ah, it's you. Lend a hand, Kvik. That's what he said. Kvik. As if anybody could be quick enough. Aren't you going to do something? I asked. Yes. Clear out, he snarled over his shoulder. I don't think I understood then what he meant. The other two had picked themselves up by that time, and they rushed together to the boat. They trampled, they wheezed, they shoved, they cursed the boat, the ship, each other. Cursed me. All in mutters. I didn't move. I didn't speak. I watched the slant of the ship. She was as still as if landed on the blocks in a dry dock. Only she was like this. He held up his hand, palm under, tips of the fingers inclined downwards. Like this, he repeated. I could see the line of the horizon before me as clear as a bell above her stem head. I could see the water far off there, black and sparkling and still, still as a pond, deadly still, more still than ever a sea was before, more still than I could bear to look at. Have you watched a ship floating head down, checked in sinking by a sheet of old iron too rotten to stand being shored up? Have you? Oh, yes, shored up. I thought of that. I thought of every mortal thing. But can you shore up a bulkhead in five minutes, or in fifty, for that matter? Where was I going to get men that would go down below? And the timber! The timber! Would you have had courage to swing a maul for the first blow if you had seen that bulkhead? Don't say you would. You had not seen it. Nobody would. Hang it! To do a thing like that you must believe there is a chance, one in a thousand at least, some ghost of a chance, and you would not have believed. Nobody would have believed. You think me a cur for standing there, but what would you have done? What? You can't tell. Nobody can tell. One must have the time to, to turn round. What would you have me do? Where was the kindness in making crazy with fright all those people I could not save single-handed, that nothing could save? Look here. As true as I sit on this chair before you. He drew quick breaths at every few words, and shot quick glances at my face, as though in his anguish he were watchful of the effect. He was not speaking to me, he was only speaking before me, in a dispute with an invisible personality, an antagonistic and inseparable partner of his existence, another possessor of his soul. These were issues beyond the competency of a court of inquiry. It was a subtle and momentous quarrel as to the true essence of life, and did not want a judge. He wanted an ally, a helper, an accomplice. I felt the risk I ran of being circumvented, blinded, decoyed, bullied, perhaps, into taking a definite part in a dispute impossible of decision if one had to be fair to all the phantoms in possession, to the reputable that had its claims, and to the disreputable that had its exigencies. I can't explain to you who haven't seen him, and who hear his words only at second hand, the mixed nature of my feelings. It seemed to me I was being made to comprehend the inconceivable, and I know of nothing to compare with the discomfort of such a sensation. I was made to look at the convention that lurks in all truths, and on the essential sincerity of falsehood. He appealed to all sides at once, to the side turned perpetually to the light of day, and to that side of us which, like the other hemisphere of the moon, 
exists stealthily in perpetual darkness, with only a fearful ashy light falling at times on the edge. He swayed me. I own up to it, I own up. The occasion was obscure, insignificant, what you will, a lost youngster, one in a million. But then he was one of us. An incident as completely devoid of importance as the flooding of an ant-heap, and yet the mystery of his attitude got hold of me as though he had been an individual in the forefront of his kind, as if the obscure truth involved were momentous enough to affect mankind's conception of itself. Marlowe paused to put new life into his expiring cheroot, seemed to forget all about the story, and abruptly began again. "'My fault, of course. One has no business, really, to get interested. It's a weakness of mine. His was of another kind. My weakness consists in not having a discriminating eye for the incidental, for the externals, no eye for the hod of the rag-picker or the fine linen of the next man. Next man, that's it. I've met so many men, he pursued with momentary sadness. Met them, too, with a certain, certain impact, let us say. Like this fellow, for instance. And in each case all I could see was merely the human being. A confounded democratic quality of vision which may be better than total blindness but has been of no advantage to me i can assure you men expect one to take into account their fine linen but i never could get up any enthusiasm about these things oh it's a failing it's a failing and then comes a soft evening a lot of men too indolent for whist and a story he paused again to wait for an encouraging remark, perhaps, but nobody spoke. Only the host, as if reluctantly performing a duty, murmured, "'You are so subtle, Marlowe.' "'Who?' "'I?' said Marlowe in a low voice. "'Oh, no. But he was. And try as I may for the success of this yarn, I am missing innumerable shades. They were so fine.' so difficult to render in colorless words, because he complicated matters by being so simple, too, the simplest poor devil. By Jove, he was amazing. There he sat, telling me that just as I saw him before my eyes, he wouldn't be afraid to face anything, and believing it, too. I tell you, it was fabulously innocent, and it was enormous, enormous, I watched him covertly, just as though I had suspected him of an intention to take a jolly good rise out of me. He was confident that, on the square, on the square, mind, there was nothing he couldn't meet. Ever since he had been so high, quite a little chap, he had been preparing himself for all the difficulties that can beset one on land and water. He confessed proudly to this kind of foresight. He had been elaborating dangers and defences, expecting the worst, rehearsing his best. He must have led a most exalted existence. Can you fancy it? A succession of adventures, so much glory, such a victorious progress, and the deep sense of his sagacity crowning every day of his inner life. He forgot himself. His eyes shone. And with every word my heart, searched by the light of his absurdity, was growing heavier in my breast. I had no mind to laugh, and, lest I should smile, I made for myself a stolid face. He gave signs of irritation. "'It is always the unexpected that happens,' I said in a propitiatory tone. My obtuseness provoked him into a contemptuous, "'Pshaw!' <laughs> I suppose he meant that the unexpected couldn't touch him. Nothing less than the unconceivable itself could get over his perfect state of preparation. He had been taken unawares, and he whispered to himself a malediction upon the waters and the firmament, upon the ship, upon the men. Everything had betrayed him. He had been tricked into that sort of high-minded resignation which prevented him from lifting as much as his little finger— 
while these others, who had a very clear perception of the actual necessity, were tumbling against each other and sweating desperately over that boat business. Something had gone wrong there at the last moment. It appears that in their flurry they had contrived in some mysterious way to get the sliding bolt of the foremost boat chalk jammed tight, and forthwith had gone out of the remnants of their minds over the deadly nature of that accident. It must have been a pretty sight, the fierce industry of these beggars toiling on a motionless ship that floated quietly in the silence of a world asleep, fighting against time for the freeing of that boat, grovelling on all fours, standing up in despair, tugging, pushing, snarling at each other venomously, ready to kill, ready to weep, and only kept from flying at each other's throats by the fear of death that stood silent behind them like an inflexible and cold-eyed taskmaster. <laughs> oh, yes, it must have been a pretty sight. He saw it all. He could talk about it with scorn and bitterness. He had a minute knowledge of it by means of some sixth sense, I conclude, because he swore to me he had remained apart, without a glance at them and at the boat, without one single glance. And I believe him. I should think he was too busy watching the threatening slant of the ship, the suspended menace discovered in the midst of the most perfect security, fascinated by the sword hanging by a hair over his imaginative head. Nothing in the world moved before his eyes, and he could depict to himself without hindrance the sudden swing upward of the dark skyline, the sudden tilt up of the vast plain of the sea, the swift still rise, the brutal fling, the grasp of the abyss, the struggle without hope, the starlight closing over his head forever like the vault of a tomb, the revolt of his young life, the black end. He could. By Jove, who couldn't? And you must remember he was a finished artist in that peculiar way. He was a gifted poor devil with the faculty of swift and forestalling vision. The sights it showed him had turned him into cold stone from the soles of his feet to the nape of his neck. Uh, but there was a hot dance of thoughts in his head, a dance of lame, blind, mute thoughts, a whirl of awful cripples. Didn't I tell you he confessed himself before me as though I had the power to bind and to loose? He burrowed deep, deep, in the hope of my absolution, which would have been of no good to him. This was one of those cases which no solemn deception can palliate, where no man can help, where his very maker seems to abandon a sinner to his own devices. He stood on the starboard side of the bridge, as far as he could get from the struggle for the boat, which went on with the agitation of madness and the stealthiness of a conspiracy. The two Malays had meantime remained holding to the wheel. Just picture to yourselves the actors in that, thank God, unique episode of the sea, four beside themselves with fierce and secret exertions, and three looking on in complete immobility over the awnings covering the profound ignorance of hundreds of human beings, with their weariness, with their dreams, with their hopes arrested, held by an invisible hand on the brink of annihilation. For that they were so makes no doubt to me. Given the state of the ship, this was the deadliest possible description of accident that could happen. These beggars by the boat had every reason to go distracted with funk, Frankly, had I been there, I would not have given as much as a counterfeit farthing for the ship's chance to keep above water to the end of each successive second. And still she floated. These sleeping pilgrims were destined to accomplish their whole pilgrimage, to the bitterness of some other end. It was as if the omnipotence whose mercy, they confessed, had needed their humble testimony on earth for a while longer and had looked down to make a sign, Thou shalt not, to the ocean. Their escape would trouble me as a prodigiously inexplicable event, did I not know how tough old iron can be, as tough sometimes as the spirit of some men we meet now and then, worn to a shadow and breasting the weight of life. 
not the least wonder of these twenty minutes to my mind is the behaviour of the two helmsmen they were amongst the native batch of all sorts brought over from aden to give evidence at the inquiry one of them labouring under intense bashfulness was very young and with his smooth yellow cheery countenance looked even younger than he was i remember perfectly briarly asking him through the interpreter what he thought of it at the time and the interpreter after a short colloquy turning to the court with an important air he says he thought nothing the other with patient blinking eyes a blue cotton handkerchief faded with much washing bound with a smart twist over a lot of grey wisps his face shrunk into grim hollows his brown skin made darker by a mesh of wrinkles explained that he had a knowledge of some evil thing befalling the ship but there had been no order he could not remember an order why should he leave the helm to some further questions he jerked back his spare shoulders and declared it never came into his mind then that the white men were about to leave the ship through fear of death he did not believe it now there might have been secret reasons he wagged his old chin knowingly aha secret reasons he was a man of great experience and he wanted that white tuan to know he turned toward briarly who didn't raise his head that he had acquired a knowledge of many things by serving white men on the sea for a great number of years. And suddenly, with shaky excitement, he poured upon our spellbound attention a lot of queer-sounding names, names of dead-and-gone skippers, names of forgotten country ships, names of familiar and distorted sound, as if the hand of dumb time had been at work on them for ages. They stopped him at last. A silence fell upon the court, a silence that remained unbroken for at least a minute, and passed gently into a deep murmur. This episode was the sensation of the second day's proceedings, affecting all the audience, affecting everybody except Jim, who was sitting moodily at the end of the first bench, and never looked up at this extraordinary and damning witness that seemed possessed of some mysterious theory of defense. So these two Lascars stuck to the helm of that ship without steerage way, where death would have found them if such had been their destiny. The whites did not give them half a glance, had probably forgotten their existence. Assuredly Jim did not remember it. He remembered he could do nothing. He could do nothing, now he was alone. There was nothing to do but stick with the ship. No use making a disturbance about it. Was there? He waited upstanding, without a sound, stiffened in the idea of some sort of heroic discretion. The first engineer ran cautiously across the bridge, to tug at his sleeve. "'Come and help! For God's sake, come and help!' He ran back to the boat on the points of his toes, and returned directly to worry at his sleeve, begging and cursing at the same time. "'I believe he would have kissed my hands!' said Jim savagely, and next moment he starts foaming and whispering in my face, "'If I had the time, I would like to crack your skull for you.' I pushed him away. Suddenly he caught hold of me round the neck. Damn him! I hit him. I hit out without looking. "'Won't you save your own life, you infernal coward?' he sobs. "'Coward!' He called me an infernal coward. <laughs> he, he called me. <laughs> he had thrown himself back and was shaking with laughter. I had never in my life heard anything so bitter as that noise. It fell like a blight on all the merriment about donkeys, pyramids, bazaars, or what not. Along the whole dim length of the gallery the voices dropped. The pale blotches of faces turned our way with one accord, and the silence became so profound that the clear tinkle of a teaspoon falling on the tessellated floor of the veranda rang out like a tiny and silvery scream. "'You mustn't laugh like this, with all these people about,' I remonstrated. "'It isn't nice for them, you know.' 
He gave no sign of having heard at first, but after a while, with a stare that, missing me altogether, seemed to probe the heart of some awful vision, he muttered carelessly, No, oh, they'll think I am drunk. And after that you would have thought from his appearance he would never make a sound again. But no fear. He could no more stop telling now than he could have stopped living by the mere exertion of his will. End of chapter 8 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 9 I was saying to myself, Sink! Curse you! Sink! These were the words with which he began again. He wanted it over. He was severely left alone, and he formulated in his head this address to the ship in a tone of imprecation, while at the same time he enjoyed the privilege of witnessing scenes, as far as I can judge, of low comedy. They were still at that bolt. The skipper was ordering, "'Get under and try to lift!' And the others naturally shirked. You understand that being squeezed flat under the keel of a boat wasn't a desirable position to be caught in if the ship went down suddenly. "'Why don't you? You the strongest!' whined the little engineer. "'Gott for damn! I am too thick!' spluttered the skipper in despair. It was funny enough to make angels weep. They stood idle for a moment, and suddenly the chief engineer rushed again at Jim. "'Come and help, man! Are you mad to throw your only chance away? Come and help, man! Man! Look there! Look!' At last Jim looked astern, where the other pointed with maniacal insistence. He saw a silent black squall, which had eaten up already one-third of the sky. You know how these squalls come up there about that time of the year. First you see a darkening of the horizon, no more. Then a cloud rises opaque like a wall. A straight edge of vapor lined with sickly whitish gleams flies up from the southwest, swallowing the stars in whole constellations. Its shadow flies over the waters and confounds the sea and sky into one abyss of obscurity. And all is still. No thunder, no wind, no sound, not a flicker of lightning. Then, in the tenebrous immensity, a livid arch appears. A swell or two, like undulations of the very darkness, run past, and suddenly wind and rain strike together with a peculiar impetuosity, as though they had burst through something solid. Such a cloud had come up while they weren't looking. They had just noticed it, and were perfectly justified in surmising that if in absolute stillness there was some chance for the ship to keep afloat a few minutes longer, the least disturbance of the sea would make an end of her instantly. Her first nod to the swell that precedes the burst of such a squall would also be her last, would become a plunge, would, so to speak, be prolonged into a long dive, down, down to the bottom. Hence these new capers of their fright, these new antics in which they displayed their extreme aversion to die. It was black, black, pursued Jim with moody steadiness. It had sneaked up upon us from behind, the infernal thing. I suppose there had been at the back of my head some hope yet, I don't know. But that was all over anyhow. It maddened me to see myself caught like this. I was angry as though I had been trapped. I was trapped. The night was hot, too, I remember. Not a breath of air. He remembered so well that, gasping in his chair, he seemed to sweat and choke before my eyes. No doubt it maddened him. It knocked him over afresh, in a manner of speaking. But it made him also remember that important purpose which had sent him rushing on that bridge only to slip clean out of his mind. He had intended to cut the lifeboats clear of the ship. He whipped out his knife and went to work, slashing, as though he had seen nothing, had heard nothing, had known of no one on board. They thought him hopelessly wrong-headed and crazy, but dared not protest noisily against this useless loss of time. When he had done, he returned to the very same spot from which he had started. The chief was there, 
ready with a clutch at him to whisper close to his head, scathingly, as though he wanted to bite his ear. "'You silly fool! Do you think you'll get at the ghost of a show when all that lot of brutes is in the water? Why, they will batter your head for you from these boats!' He wrung his hands, ignored, at Jim's elbow. The skipper kept up a nervous shuffle in one place and mumbled, "'Hammer! Hammer! Mein Gott! Get a hammer!' The little engineer whimpered like a child, but broken arm at all, he turned out the least craven of the lot, as it seems, and actually mustered enough pluck to run an errand to the engine-room. No trifle, it must be, owned in fairness to him. Jim told me he darted desperate looks like a cornered man, gave one low wail, and dashed off. He was back instantly, clambering, hammer in hand, and without a pause flung himself at the bolt. The others gave Jim up at once, and ran off to assist. He heard the tap-tap of the hammer, the sound of the released chalk falling over. The boat was clear. Only then he turned to look, only then. But he kept his distance, he kept his distance. He wanted me to know he had kept his distance, that there was nothing in common between him and these men who had the hammer. Nothing whatever. It is more than probable he thought himself cut off from them by a space that could not be traversed, by an obstacle that could not be overcome, by a chasm without bottom. He was as far as he could get from them, the whole breadth of the ship. His feet were glued to that remote spot, and his eyes to their indistinct group, bowed together and swaying strangely in the common torment of fear. A hand-lamp lashed to a stanchion above a little table rigged up on the bridge—the Patna had no chart-room amidships—threw a light on their laboring shoulders, on their arched and bobbing backs. They pushed at the bow of the boat, they pushed out into the night, they pushed and would no more look back at him. They had given him up, as if indeed he had been too far, too hopelessly separated from themselves, to be worth an appealing word a glance, or a sign. They had no leisure to look back upon his passive heroism, to feel the sting of his abstention. The boat was heavy. They pushed at the bow, with no breath to spare for an encouraging word. But the turmoil of terror that had scattered their self-command like chaff before the wind converted their desperate exertions into a bit of fooling upon my word, fit for knockabout clowns in a farce. They pushed with their hands, with their heads, they pushed for dear life, with all the weight of their bodies, they pushed with all the might of their souls. Only no sooner had they succeeded in canting the stem clear of the David, than they would leave off like one man and start a wild scramble into her. As a natural consequence, the boat would swing in abruptly, driving them back, helpless and jostling against each other. They would stand nonplussed for a while, exchanging in fierce whispers all the infamous names they could call to mind, and go at it again. Three times this occurred. He described it to me with morose thoughtfulness. He hadn't lost a single movement of that comic business. I loathed them. I hated them. I had to look at all that, he said, without emphasis turning upon me a somberly watchful glance. Was there ever any one so shamefully tried? He took his head in his hands for a moment, like a man driven to distraction by some unspeakable outrage. These were things he could not explain to the court, and not even to me, but I would have been little fitted for the reception of his confidences had I not been able at times to understand the pauses between the words. In this assault upon his fortitude there was the jeering intention of a spiteful and vile vengeance. There was an element of burlesque in his ordeal, a degradation of funny grimaces in the approach of death or dishonor. He related facts which I have not forgotten, but at this distance of time I couldn't recall his very words. I only remember that he managed wonderfully to convey the brooding rancor of his mind 
into the bare recital of events. Twice, he told me, he shut his eyes in the certitude that the end was upon him already, and twice he had to open them again. Each time he noted the darkening of the great stillness. The shadow of the silent cloud had fallen upon the ship from the zenith, and seemed to have extinguished every sound of her teeming life. He could no longer hear the voices under the awnings. He told me that each time he closed his eyes a flash of thought showed him that crowd of bodies laid out for death, as plain as daylight. When he opened them, it was to see the dim struggle of four men fighting like mad with a stubborn boat. They would fall back before it, time after time, stand swearing at each other, and suddenly make another rush in a bunch, enough to make you die laughing, he commented with downcast eyes. Then, raising them for a moment to my face with a dismal smile, I ought to have a merry life of it, by God, for I shall see that funny sight a good many times yet before I die. His eyes fell again. See and hear. See and hear. He repeated twice, at long intervals filled by vacant staring. He roused himself. "'I made up my mind to keep my eyes shut,' he said. "'And I couldn't. I couldn't, and I don't care who knows it. Let them go through that kind of thing before they talk. Just let them, and do better. That's all. The second time my eyelids flew open, and my mouth, too, I had felt the ship move. She just dipped her bows, and lifted them gently, and slow, everlastingly slow, and ever so little. She hadn't done that much for days. The cloud had raced ahead, and this first swell seemed to travel upon a sea of lead. There was no life in that stir. It managed, though, to knock over something in my head. What would you have done? You are sure of yourself, aren't you? What would you do if you felt now, this minute? The house here, move, just move a little under your chair. Leap, by heavens! You would take one spring from where you sit and land in that clump of bushes yonder. He flung his arm out at the night beyond the stone balustrade. I held my peace. He looked at me very steadily, very severe. There could be no mistake, I was being bullied now, and it behooved me to make no sign, lest by a gesture or a word I should be drawn into a fatal admission about myself, which would have had some bearing on the case. I was not disposed to take any risk of that sort. Don't forget I had him before me, and really he was too much like one of us not to be dangerous. But if you want to know, I don't mind telling you that I did, with a rapid glance, estimate the distance to the mass of denser blackness in the middle of the grass plot before the veranda. He exaggerated. I would have landed short by several feet, and that's the only thing of which I am fairly certain. <laughs> the last moment had come, as he thought, and he did not move. His feet remained glued to the planks as if his thoughts were knocking about loose in his head. It was at this moment, too, that he saw one of the men around the boat step backward suddenly, clutch at the air with raised arms, totter, and collapse. He didn't exactly fall. He only slid gently into a sitting posture, all hunched up, and with his shoulders propped against the side of the engine-room skylight. That was the donkey-man the haggard, white-faced chap with a ragged moustache, acted third engineer, he explained. Mm, dead, I said. We had heard something of that in court. So they say, he pronounced with sombre indifference. Of course I never knew. Weak heart. The man had been complaining of being out of sorts for some time before. Excitement, overexertion, devil only knows. <laughs> It was easy to see he did not want to die either. Droll, isn't it? May I be shot if he hadn't been fooled into killing himself. Fooled! Neither more nor less. Fooled into it, by heavens! Just as I— Ah, oh, if he had only kept still! 
if he had only told them to go to the devil when they came to rush him out of his bunk because the ship was sinking, if he had only stood by with his hands in his pockets and called them names. He got up, shook his fist, glared at me, and sat down. A chance missed, eh? I murmured. Why don't you laugh? he said. A joke hatched in hell. Weak heart. I wish sometimes mine had been. This irritated me. Do you? I exclaimed with deep-rooted irony. Yes. Can't you understand? he cried. I don't know what more you could wish for, I said angrily. He gave me an utterly uncomprehending glance. This shaft had also gone wide of the mark, and he was not the man to bother about stray arrows. Upon my word, he was too unsuspecting. He was not fair game. I was glad that my missile had been thrown away, that he had not even heard the twang of the bow. Of course he could not know at the time the man was dead. The next minute, his last on board, was crowded with a tumult of events and sensations which beat about him like the sea upon a rock. I use the simile advisedly, because from his relation I am forced to believe he had preserved through it all a strange illusion of passiveness, as though he had not acted, but had suffered himself to be handled by the infernal powers who had selected him for the victim of their practical joke. The first thing that came to him was the grinding surge of the heavy davits swinging out at last, a jar which seemed to enter his body from the deck through the soles of his feet, and travel up his spine to the crown of his head. Then, the squall being very near now, Another and a heavier swell lifted the passive hull in a threatening heave that checked his breath, while his brain and his heart together were pierced as with daggers by panic-stricken screams. "'Let go! For God's sake, let go! Let go! She's going!' Following upon that, the boat falls ripped through the blocks, and a lot of men began to talk in startled tones under the awnings. "'When these beggars did break out, their yelps were enough to wake the dead,' he said. Next, after the splashing shock of the boat literally dropped in the water, came the hollow noises of stamping and tumbling in her, mingled with confused shouts. "'Unhook! Unhook! Shove! Unhook! Shove for your life! Here's the squall down on us!' He heard, high above his head, the faint muttering of the wind. He heard below his feet a cry of pain. A lost voice alongside started cursing a swivel-hook. The ship began to buzz fore and aft like a disturbed hive, and as quietly as he was telling me all of this, because just then he was very quiet in attitude, in face, in voice, he went on to say, without the slightest warning, as it were, "'I stumbled over his legs.' This was the first I heard of his having moved at all. I could not restrain a grunt of surprise. Something had started him off at last. But of the exact moment of the cause that tore him out of his immobility, he knew no more than the uprooted tree knows of the wind that laid it low. All of this had come to him, the sounds, the sights, the legs of the dead man, by Jove. The infernal joke was being crammed devilishly down his throat. But, look you, he was not going to admit any sort of swallowing motion in his gullet. It's extraordinary how he could cast upon you the spirit of his illusion. I listened as if to a tale of black magic at work upon a corpse. He went over sideways, very gently, and this is the last thing I remember seeing on board, he continued. I did not care what he did. It looked as though he were picking himself up. I thought he was picking himself up, of course. I expected him to bolt past me over the rail, and drop into the boat after the others. I could hear them knocking about down there, and a voice as if crying up a shaft called out, George! Then the three voices together raised a yell. They came to me separately. One bleated, another screamed, one howled. Ugh! He shivered a little, 
and I beheld him rise slowly, as if a steady hand from above had been pulling him out of the chair by his hair. Up, slowly, to his full height, and when his knees had locked stiff, the hand let him go, and he swayed a little on his feet. There was a suggestion of awful stillness in his face, in his movements, in his very voice, when he said, "'They shouted.' and involuntarily I pricked up my ears for the ghost of that shout that would be heard directly through the false effect of silence. "'There were eight hundred people in that ship,' he said, impaling me to the back of my seat with an awful blank stare. Eight hundred living people, and they were yelling after one dead man to come down and be saved. "'Jump, George, jump!' Oh, jump! I stood by with my hand on the David. I was very quiet. It had come over pitch dark. You could see neither sky nor sea. I heard the boat alongside go bump, bump, and not another sound down there for a while, but the ship under me was full of talking noises. Suddenly the skipper howled, Mein Gott! The squall! The squall! Shove off! With the first hiss of rain and the first gust of wind, they screamed, Jump, George! We'll catch you! Jump! The ship began a slow plunge. The rain swept over her like a broken sea. My cap flew off my head. My breath was driven back into my throat. I heard as if I had been on the top of a tower another wild screech, George! Oh, jump! She was going down down, head first under me. He raised his hand deliberately to his face, and made picking motions with his fingers as though he had been bothered with cobwebs, and afterwards he looked into the open palm for quite half a second, before he blurted out, I had jumped. He checked himself, averted his gaze. It seems, he added, his clear blue eyes turned to me with a piteous stare, and looking at him, standing before me, dumbfounded and hurt, I was oppressed by a sad sense of resigned wisdom, mingled with the amused and profound pity of an old man helpless before a childish disaster. "'Looks like it,' I muttered. "'I knew nothing about it till I looked up,' he explained hastily. And that's possible, too. You had to listen to him as you would to a small boy in trouble. He didn't know. It had happened somehow. It would never happen again. He had landed partly on somebody and fallen across a thwart. He felt as though all his ribs on his left side must be broken. Then he rolled over and saw vaguely the ship he had deserted uprising above him with the red side-light glowing large in the rain like a fire on the brow of a hill seen through a mist. She seemed higher than a wall. She loomed like a cliff over the boat. I wished I could die, he cried. There was no going back. It was as if I had jumped into a well, into an everlasting deep hole. End of chapter 9 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 10 He locked his fingers together and tore them apart. Nothing could be more true. He had indeed jumped into an everlasting deep hole. He had tumbled from a height he could never scale again. By that time the boat had gone driving forward past the bows. It was too dark just then for them to see each other, and... Moreover, they were blinded and half-drowned with rain. He told me it was like being swept by a flood through a cavern. They turned their backs to the squall. The skipper, it seems, got an oar over the stern to keep the boat before it, and for two or three minutes the end of the world had come through a deluge and a pitchy blackness. The sea hissed like twenty thousand kettles. That's his simile, not mine. I fancy there was not much wind after the first gust, and he himself admitted at the inquiry 
that the sea never got up that night to any extent. He crouched down in the bows and stole a furtive glance back. He saw just one yellow gleam of the masthead light high up and blurred like a lost star ready to dissolve. It terrified me to see it still there, he said. That's what he said. What terrified him was the thought that the drowning was not over yet. No doubt he wanted to be done with that abomination as quickly as possible. Nobody in the boat made a sound. In the dark she seemed to fly, of course, but she could not have had much way. Then the shower swept ahead, and the great distracting hissing noise followed the rain into the distance and died out. There was nothing to be heard but the slight wash about the boat's sides. Somebody's teeth were chattering violently. A hand touched his back. A faint voice said, "'You there?' Another cried out shakily, "'She's gone!' And they all stood up together to look astern. They saw no bright lights. All was black. A thin, cold drizzle was driving into their faces. The boat lurched slightly. The teeth chattered faster, stopped, and began again twice before the man could master his shiver sufficiently to say, J -j "'Just in t -t -t time!' <sighs> he recognized the voice of the chief engineer, saying surlily, "'I saw her go down. I happened to turn my head.' The wind had dropped almost completely. They watched in the dark, with their heads half turned to windward, as if expecting to hear cries. At first he was thankful the night had covered up the scene before his eyes, and then to know of it, and yet to have seen or heard nothing, appeared somehow the culminating point of an awful misfortune. "'Strange, isn't it?' he murmured, interrupting himself in his disjointed narrative. It did not seem so strange to me. He must have had an unconscious conviction that the reality could not be half as bad, not half as anguishing, appalling, and vengeful as the created terror of his imagination. I believe that in this first moment his heart was wrung with all the suffering, that his soul knew the accumulated savor of all the fear, all the horror, all the despair of eight hundred human beings pounced upon in the night by a sudden and violent death. Else why should he have said, it, it seemed to me that I must jump out of that accursed boat, and swim back to sea, half a mile, more, any distance, to the very spot? Why this impulse? Do you see the significance? Why back to the very spot? Why not drown alongside, if he meant drowning? Why back to the very spot to see, as if his imagination had to be soothed by the assurance that all was over before death could bring relief? I defy any one of you to offer another explanation. It is one of those bizarre and exciting glimpses through the fog. It was an extraordinary disclosure. He let it out as the most natural thing one can say. He fought down that impulse, and then he became conscious of the silence— he mentioned this to me, a silence of the sea, of the sky, merged into one indefinite immensity, still as death around these saved, palpitating lives. "'You might have heard a pin-drop in that boat,' he said, with a queer contraction of his lips, like a man trying to master his sensibilities while relating some extremely moving fact. "'A silence!' God alone, who had willed him as he was, knows what he made of it in his heart. I didn't think any spot on earth could be so still, he said. You couldn't distinguish the sea from the sky. There was nothing to see and nothing to hear, not a glimmer, not a shape, not a sound. You could have believed that every bit of dry land had gone to the bottom, that every man on earth but I and these beggars in the boat had got drowned. He leaned over the table with his knuckles propped amongst the coffee cups, liquor glasses, cigar ends. I seemed to believe it. Everything was gone, and all was over. He fetched a deep sigh with me. Marlowe sat up abruptly and flung away his cheroot with force. 
It made a darting red trail like a toy rocket fired through the drapery of creepers. Nobody stirred. "'Hey, what do you think of it?' he cried with sudden animation. "'Wasn't he true to himself? Wasn't he? His saved life was over for want of ground under his feet, for want of sights for his eyes, for want of voices in his ears. Annihilation, eh?' And all the time it was only a clouded sky, a sea that did not break, the air that did not stir. Only a night, only a silence. It lasted for a while, and then they were suddenly and unanimously moved to make a noise over their escape. I knew from the first she would go. Not a minute too soon. A narrow squeak, begosh! He said nothing. But the breeze that had dropped came back, a gentle draught freshened steadily, and the sea joined its murmuring voice to this talkative reaction succeeding the dumb moments of awe. She was gone! She was gone! Not a doubt of it! Nobody could have helped. They repeated the same words over and over again, as though they couldn't stop themselves. Never doubted she would go. The lights were gone. No mistake. The lights were gone. Couldn't expect anything else. She had to go. He noticed that they talked as though they had left behind nothing but an empty ship. They concluded she would not have been long when once she started. It seemed to cause them some sort of satisfaction. They assured each other that she couldn't have been long about it. Just shot down like a flat iron. The chief engineer declared that the masthead light at the moment of sinking seemed to drop like a lighted match you throw down. At this the second laughed hysterically. I'm glad. I'm glad. His teeth went on like an electric rattle, said Jim, and all at once he began to cry. He wept and blubbered like a child, catching his breath and sobbing. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. He would be quiet for a while and start suddenly. Oh, my poor arm. Oh, my poor arm. I felt I could knock him down. Some of them sat in the stern sheets. I could just make out their shapes. Voices came to me, mumble, mumble, grunt, grunt. All this seemed very hard to bear. I was cold, too, and I could do nothing. I thought that if I moved I would have to go over the side and— His hand groped steadily, came in contact with a liquor glass, and was withdrawn suddenly, as if it had touched a red-hot coal. I pushed the bottle slightly. "'Won't you have some more?' I asked. He looked at me angrily. "'Don't you think I can tell you what there is to tell without screwing myself up?' he asked. The squad of globetrotters had gone to bed. We were alone but for a vague white form erect in the shadow that, at being looked at, cringed forward, hesitated, backed away silently. It was getting late, but I did not hurry my guest.' In the midst of his forlorn state he heard his companions begin to abuse someone. "'What kept you from jumping, you lunatic?' said a scolding voice. The chief engineer left the stern sheets, and could be heard clamouring forward as if with hostile intentions against the greatest idiot that ever was. The skipper shouted with rasping effort offensive epithets from where he sat at the oar. He lifted his head at that uproar, and heard the name George— while a hand in the dark struck him on the breast. "'What have you got to say for yourself, you fool?' queried somebody, with a sort of virtuous fury. "'They were after me,' he said. "'They were abusing me, abusing me, by the name of George.' He paused to stare, tried to smile, turned his eyes away, and went on. "'That little second puts his head right under my nose.' "'Why, it's that blasted mate!' "'What?' howls the skipper from the other end of the boat. "'No!' shrieks the chief, and he too stooped to look in my face. The wind had left the boat suddenly. The rain began to fall again, and the soft, uninterrupted, a little mysterious sound with which the sea receives a shower arose on all sides in the night. They were too taken aback to say anything more at first— he narrated steadily. And what could I have to say to them? He faltered for a moment, made an effort to go on. They called me horrible names. His voice, sinking to a whisper, now and then would leap up suddenly, hardened by the passion of scorn, 
as though he had been talking of secret abominations. Never mind what they called me, he said grimly. I could hear hate in their voices. A good thing, too. They could not forgive me for being in that boat. They hated it. It made them mad. He laughed short. But it kept me from— Look, I was sitting with my arms crossed on the gunwale. He perched himself smartly on the edge of the table and crossed his arms. Like this, see? One little tilt backwards and I would have been gone, after the others. One little tilt. The least bit. The least bit. He frowned, and tapping his forehead with the tip of his middle finger, "'It was there all the time,' he said impressively. "'All the time. That notion. And the rain. Cold, thick. Cold as melted snow. Colder on my thin cotton clothes. I'll never be so cold again in my life, I know. And the sky was black, too, all black. Not a star, not a light anywhere. Nothing outside that confounded boat.' and those two yapping before me like a couple of mean mongrels at a treed thief. Yep, yep. What are you doing here? You're a fine sort. Too much of a bloomin' gentleman to put your hand to it. Come out of a trance, did you? To sneak in, did you? Yep, yep. You ain't fit to live. Yep, yep. Two of them together trying to outbark each other. <laughs> the other would bay from the stern through the rain. Couldn't see him. Couldn't make it out some of his filthy jargon. Yap, yap, bow, wow, 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 yap, yap. It was sweet to hear them. It kept me alive, I tell you. It saved my life. At it they went, as if trying to drive me overboard with the noise. I wonder you had pluck enough to jump. You ain't wanted here. If I'd known who it was, I would have tipped you over, you skunk. What have you done with the other? Where did you get the pluck to jump, you coward? What's to prevent us three from firing you overboard? They were out of breath. The shower passed away upon the sea. Then nothing. There was nothing round the boat. Not even a sound. Wanted to see me overboard, did they? Upon my soul. I think they would have had their wish if they had only kept quiet. Fire me overboard, would they? Try, I said. I would for a tuppence. Too good for you, they screeched together. It was so dark that it was only when one or the other of them moved that I was quite sure of seeing him. By heavens, I only wish they'd tried. I couldn't help exclaiming, What an extraordinary affair! Not bad, eh? He said, as if in some sort astounded. They pretended to think I'd done away with that donkey man for some reason or other. Why should I? And how the devil was I to know? Didn't I get somehow into that boat? into that boat? I—I— uh, The muscles round his lips contracted into an unconscious grimace that tore through the mask of his usual expression, something violent, short-lived and illuminating, like a twist of lightning, that admits the eye for an instant into the secret convolutions of a cloud. I did. I was plainly there with them, wasn't I? Isn't it awful a man should be driven to do a thing like that, and be responsible? What did I know about their George they were howling after? I remembered I had seen him curled up on the deck. Murdering coward, the chief kept on calling me. He didn't seem able to remember any other two words. I didn't care, only his noise began to worry me. Shut up, I said. At that he collected himself for a confounded screech. "'You killed him! You killed him!' "'No,' I shouted, "'but I will kill you directly!' I jumped up, and he fell backwards over a thwart with an awful loud thump. I don't know why. Too tired. Tried to step back, I suppose. I stood still, facing aft, and the wretched little second began to whine. "'You ain't gonna hit a chap with a broken arm!' "'And you call yourself a gentleman, too?' I heard a heavy tramp, one, two, and wheezy grunting. The other beast was coming at me, clattering his oar over the stern. I saw him moving, big, big, as you see a man in a mist, in a dream. "'Come on!' I cried. I would have tumbled him over like a bale of shakings. He stopped, muttered to himself, and went back. Perhaps he had heard the wind. I didn't. 
It was the last heavy gust we had. He went back to his oar. I was sorry. I would have tried to... to... He opened and closed his curved fingers, and his hands had an eager and cruel flutter. Steady. Steady, I murmured. Eh? What? I'm not excited, he remonstrated, awfully hurt, and with a convulsive jerk of his elbow knocked over the cognac bottle. I started forward, scraping my chair. He bounced off the table as if a mine had been exploded behind his back, and half turned before he alighted, crouching on his feet to show me a startled pair of eyes and a face white about the nostrils. A look of intense annoyance succeeded. Awfully sorry. How clumsy of me, he mumbled, very vexed, while the pungent odor of spilt alcohol enveloped us suddenly with an atmosphere of a low drinking bout in the cool, pure darkness of the night. The lights had been put out in the dining hall. Our candle glimmered solitary in the long gallery, and the columns had turned black from pediment to capital. On the vivid stars the high corner of the harbor office stood out distinct across the esplanade, as though the somber pile had glided nearer to see and hear. He assumed an air of indifference. I dare say I am less calm now than I was then. I was ready for anything. These were trifles. You had a lively time of it in that boat, I remarked. I was ready, he repeated. After the ship's lights had gone, anything might have happened in that boat, anything in the world, and the world no wiser. I felt this, and I was pleased. It was just dark enough, too. We were like men walled up quick in a roomy grave, no concern with anything on earth. Nobody to pass an opinion, nothing mattered. For the third time during this conversation he laughed harshly, but there was no one about to suspect him of being only drunk. No fear, no laws, no sounds, no eyes, not even our own, till, till sunrise, at least. I was struck by the suggestive truth of his words. There is something peculiar in a small boat upon the wide sea. Over the lives born from under the shadow of death there seems to fall the shadow of madness. When your ship fails you, your whole world seems to fail you. The world that made you, restrained you, took care of you. It is as if the souls of men floating on an abyss and in touch with immensity had been set free for any excess of heroism, absurdity, or abomination. Of course, as with belief, thought, love, hate, conviction, or even the visual aspect of material things, there are as many shipwrecks as there are men. And in this one there was something abject which made the isolation more complete. There was a villainy of circumstances that cut these men off more completely from the rest of mankind, whose ideal of conduct had never undergone the trial of a fiendish and appalling joke. They were exasperated with him for being a half-hearted shirker. He focused on them his hatred of the whole thing. He would have liked to take a signal revenge for the abhorrent opportunity they had put in his way. Trust a boat on the high seas to bring out the irrational that lurks at the bottom of every thought, sentiment, sensation, emotion. It was part of the burlesque meanness pervading that particular disaster at sea that they did not come to blows. It was all threats, all a terribly effective feint, a sham from beginning to end planned by the tremendous disdain of dark powers whose real terrors, always on the verge of triumph, are perpetually foiled by the steadfastness of men. I asked, after waiting for a while, Well, what happened? A futile question. I knew too much already to hope for the grace of a single uplifting touch for the favor of hinted madness of shadowed horror. Nothing, he said. I meant business, but they meant noise only. Nothing happened. And the rising sun found him, just as he had jumped up first in the bows of the boat. What a persistence of readiness! He had been holding the tiller in his hand, too, all the night. They had dropped the rudder overboard while attempting to ship it, and I suppose the tiller got kicked forward somehow while they were rushing up and down that boat, 
trying to do all sorts of things at once, so as to get clear of the side. It was a long, heavy piece of hard wood, and apparently he had been clutching it for six hours or so, if you don't call that being ready. Can you imagine him, silent and on his feet half the night, his face to the gusts of rain, staring at sombre forms watchful of vague movements, straining his ears to catch rare low murmurs in the stern-sheets? Firmness of courage or effort of fear? What do you think? And the endurance is undeniable, too, six hours more or less on the defensive, six hours of alert mobility while the boat drove slowly or floated, arrested, according to the caprice of the wind, while the sea, calmed, slept at last, while the clouds passed above his head, while the sky, from an immensity lusterless and black, diminished to a sombre and lustrous vault, scintillated with a greater brilliance, faded to the east, paled at the zenith, while the dark shapes blotting the low stars astern got outlines, relief became shoulders, heads, faces, features, confronted him with dreary stares, had disheveled hair, torn clothes, blinked red eyelids at the white dawn. They looked as though they'd been knocking about drunk in gutters for a week, he described graphically, and then he muttered something about the sunrise being of a kind that foretells a calm day. You know that sailor habit of referring to the weather in every connection. And on my side his few mumbled words were enough to make me see the lower limb of the sun clearing the line of the horizon, the tremble of a vast ripple running over all the visible expanse of the sea, as if the waters had shuddered giving birth to the globe of light, while the last puff of the breeze would stir the air with a sigh of relief. They sat in the stern, shoulder to shoulder, with the skipper in the middle, like three dirty owls, and stared at me, I heard him say, with an intention of hate that distilled a corrosive virtue into the commonplace words, like a drop of powerful poison falling into a glass of water. But my thoughts dwelled upon that sunrise. I could imagine, under the pellucid emptiness of the sky, these four men, imprisoned in the solitude of the sea, the lonely sun, regardless of the speck of life ascending the clear curve of the heaven as if to gaze ardently from a greater height at his own splendor reflected in the still ocean. They called out to me from aft, said Jim, as though we had been chums together. I heard them. They were begging me to be sensible and drop that blooming piece of wood. Why would I carry on so? They hadn't done me any harm, had they? There had been no harm. No harm. His face crimsoned as though he could not get rid of the air in his lungs. No harm, he burst out. I leave it to you. Can you understand? Can't you? You see it, don't you? No harm. Good God, what more could they have done? Oh, yes, I know very well. I jumped. Certainly, I jumped. I, I told you I jumped. But I tell you they were too much for any man. It was their doing as plainly as if they had reached up with a boat-hook and pulled me over. Can't you see it? You must see it. Come, speak, straight out. His uneasy eyes fastened upon mine, questioned, begged, challenged, entreated. For the life of me I couldn't help murmuring, "'You've been tried. More than is fair,' he caught up swiftly. "'I wasn't given half a chance with a gang like that. And now they were friendly. Oh, so damnably friendly. Chums, shipmates, all in the same boat. Make the best of it. They hadn't meant anything. They didn't care a hang for George. George had gone back to his berth for something at the last moment and got caught.' The man was a manifest fool, very sad, of course. Their eyes looked at me, their lips moved, they wagged their heads at the other end of the boat. Three of them, they beckoned to me. Why not? Hadn't I jumped? I said nothing. There are no words for the sort of things I wanted to say. Had I opened my lips just then, I would have simply howled like an animal. I was asking myself when I would wake up. They urged me aloud to come aft and hear quietly what the skipper had to say. We were sure to be picked up before the evening. 
right in the track of all the canal traffic. There was smoke to the northwest now. It gave me an awful shock to see this faint, faint blur, this low trail of brown mist through which you could see the boundary of sea and sky. I called out to them that I could hear very well where I was. The skipper started swearing as hoarse as a crow. He wasn't going to talk at the top of his voice for my accommodation. "'Are you afraid they will hear you on shore?' I asked. He glared as if he would have liked to claw me to pieces. The chief engineer advised him to humor me. He said I wasn't in my right head yet. The other rose astern like a thick pillar of flesh, and talked, talked. Jim remained thoughtful. "'Well,' I said. "'What did I care what story they agreed to make up?' he cried recklessly. "'They could tell what jolly well they liked. It was their business. I knew the story. Nothing they could make people believe could alter it for me. I let him talk, argue, talk, argue. He went on and on and on. Suddenly I felt my legs give way under me. I was sick, tired, tired to death. I let fall the tiller turned my back on them, and sat down on the foremost thwart. I had enough. They called to me to know if I understood. Wasn't it true, every word of it? It was true by God after their fashion. I did not turn my head. I heard them palavering together. The silly ass won't say anything. Oh, he understands well enough. Let him be. He will be all right. What can he do? What could I do? Weren't we all in the same boat? I tried to be deaf. The smoke had disappeared to the northward. It was dead calm. They had a drink from the water-breaker, and I drank too. Afterward they made a great business of spreading the boat-sail over the gunwales. Would I keep a lookout? They crept under, out of my sight, thank God. I felt weary, weary, done up as if I hadn't had one hour's sleep since the day I was born. I couldn't see the water for the glitter of the sunshine. From time to time one of them would creep out, stand up to take a look all round, and get under again. I could hear spells of snoring below the sail. Some of them could sleep, one of them at least. I couldn't. All was light, light, and the boat seemed to be falling through it. Now and then I would feel quite surprised to find myself sitting on a thwart. He began to walk with measured steps to and fro before my chair, one hand in his trousers pocket, his head bent thoughtfully, and his right arm at long intervals raised for a gesture that seemed to put out of his way an invisible intruder. "'I suppose you think I was going mad,' he began in a changed tone. And well you may, if you remember I had lost my cap. The sun crept all the way from east to west over my bare head. But that day I could not come to any harm, I suppose. The sun could not make me mad. His right arm put aside the idea of madness. Neither could it kill me. Again the arm repulsed a shadow. That rested with me. Did it? I said, inexpressibly amazed at this new turn and I looked at him with the same sort of feeling I might be fairly conceived to experience had he, after spinning round on his heel, presented an altogether new face. "'I didn't get brain fever. I did not drop dead, either,' he went on. "'I didn't bother myself at all about the sun over my head. I was thinking as coolly as any man that ever sat thinking in the shade. That greasy beast of a skipper poked his big cropped head from under the canvas— and screwed his fishy eyes up at me. Donner Vetter, you will die, he growled, and drew in like a turtle. I had seen him, I had heard him. He didn't interrupt me. I was thinking just then that I wouldn't. He tried to sound my thought with an attentive glance dropped on me in passing. Do you mean to say you had been deliberating with yourself whether you would die? I asked in as impenetrable a tone as I could command. He nodded without stopping. "'Yes, it had come to that as I sat there alone,' he said. He passed on a few steps to the imaginary end of his beat, and when he flung round to come back both his hands were thrust deep into his pockets. 
He stopped short in front of my chair and looked down. "'Don't you believe it?' he inquired with tense curiosity. I was moved to make the solemn declaration of my readiness to believe implicitly anything he thought fit to tell me. End of chapter 10 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 11 he heard me out with his head on one side, and I had another glimpse through a rent in the mist in which he moved and had his being. The dim candle spluttered within the ball of glass, and that was all I had to see him by. At his back was the dark night with the clear stars, whose distant glitter, disposed in retreating planes, lured the eye into the depths of a greater darkness. And yet a mysterious light seemed to show me his boyish head, as if in that moment the youth within him had, for a moment, glowed and expired. "'You are an awful good sort to listen like this,' he said. "'It does me good. You don't know what it is to me. You don't—' Words seemed to fail him. It was a distinct glimpse. He was a youngster of the sort you like to see about you of the sort you like to imagine yourself to have been, of the sort whose appearance claims the fellowship of these illusions you had thought gone out, extinct, cold, and which, as if rekindled at the approach of another flame, give a flutter deep, deep down somewhere, give a flutter of light, of heat. Yes, I had a glimpse of him then, and it was not the last of its kind." You don't know what it is for a fellow in my position to, to be believed. Make a clean breast of it to an elder man. It is so difficult, so awfully unfair, so hard to understand. The mists were closing again. I don't know how old I appeared to him, and how much wise. Not half as old as I felt just then, not half as uselessly wise as I knew myself to be. Surely in no other craft, as in that of the sea, do the hearts of those already launched to sink or swim go out so much to the youth on the brink, looking with shining eyes upon that glitter of the vast surface which is only a reflection of his own glances full of fire. There is such a magnificent vagueness in the expectations that had driven each of us to the sea, such a glorious indefiniteness such a beautiful greed of adventures that are their own and only reward. What we get, well, we won't talk of that. But can one of us restrain a smile? In no other kind of life is the illusion more wide of reality. In no other is the beginning all illusion, the disenchantment more swift, the subjugation more complete. Hadn't we all commenced with the same desire— ended with the same knowledge, carried the memory of the same cherished glamour through the sordid days of imprecation? <laughs> what wonder that when some heavy prod gets home the bond is found to be close, that besides the fellowship of the craft there is felt the strength of a wider feeling, the feeling that binds a man to a child. He was there before me, believing that age and wisdom can find a remedy against the pain of truth, giving me a glimpse of himself as a young fellow in a scrape that is the very devil of a scrape, the sort of scrape greybeards wag at solemnly while they hide a smile. And he had been deliberating upon death, confound him. He had found that to meditate about, because he thought he had saved his life, while all its glamour had gone with the ship in the night. What more natural! It was tragic enough and funny enough in all conscience to call aloud for compassion. And in what was I better than the rest of us to refuse him my pity? And even as I looked at him the mist rolled into the rent, and his voice spoke. I, I was so lost, you know. It was the sort of thing one does not expect to happen to one. It was not like a fight, for instance. It was not, I admitted. He appeared changed, as if he had suddenly matured. One couldn't be sure, he muttered. Ah, you were not sure, I said, 
and was placated by the sound of a faint sigh that passed between us like the flight of a bird in the night. "'Well, I wasn't,' he said courageously. "'It was something like that wretched story they made up. It was not a lie, but it wasn't truth all the same. It was something. One knows a downright lie. There was not the thickness of a sheet of paper between the right and the wrong of this affair.' "'How much more did you want?' I asked. "'But I think I spoke so low that he did not catch what I said. "'He had advanced his argument as though life had been a network of paths separated by chasms. "'His voice sounded reasonable. "'Suppose I had not. "'I mean to say, suppose I had stuck to the ship. "'Well, how much longer? "'Say a minute, half a minute.' "'Come, in thirty seconds, as it seemed certain then, I would have been overboard. "'And do you think I would not have laid hold of the first thing that came in my way? "'Or, life-boy, grating anything, wouldn't you?' "'And be saved,' I interjected. "'I would have meant to be,' he retorted. "'And that's more than I meant when I—' "'He shivered, as if about to swallow some nauseous drug. "'Jumped!' he pronounced, with a convulsive effort, whose stress, as if propagated by the waves of the air, made my body stir a little in the chair. He fixed me with lowering eyes. "'Don't you believe me?' he cried. "'I swear! Confound it! You got me here to talk, and you must! You said you would believe!' "'Of course I do,' I protested, in a matter-of-fact tone which produced a calming effect. "'Forgive me,' he said. "'Of course I wouldn't have talked to you about this if you had not been a gentleman. I ought to have known. I am—I am—a gentleman, too.' "'Yes, yes,' I said hastily. He was looking me squarely in the face, and withdrew his gaze slowly. "'Now you understand why I didn't, after all—didn't go out in that way. I wasn't going to be frightened at what I had done.' And anyhow, if I had stuck to this ship, I would have done my best to be saved. Men have been known to float for hours in the open sea, and be picked up not much the worse for it. I might have lasted it out better than many others. There's nothing the matter with my heart. He withdrew his right fist from his pocket, and the blow he struck on his chest resounded like a muffled detonation in the night. No, I said. He meditated, with his legs slightly apart and his chin sunk. "'A hair's breadth,' he muttered. "'Not the breadth of a hair between this and that. "'And at the time. "'It is difficult to see a hair at midnight,' I put in. "'A little viciously, I fear. "'Don't you see what I mean by the solidarity of the craft? I was aggrieved against him as though he had cheated me, me of a splendid opportunity to keep up the illusion of my beginnings, as though he had robbed our common life of the last spark of its glamour. And so you cleared out at once. Jumped, he corrected me incisively. Jumped, mind, he repeated. And I wondered at the evident but obscure intention. Well, yes. Perhaps I could not see then, but I had plenty of time and any amount of light in that boat. And I could think, too. Nobody would know, of course, but this did not make it any easier for me. You've got to believe that, too. I did not want all this talk. No. Yes. I won't lie. I, I wanted it. It is the very thing I wanted. There. Do you think you or anybody could have made me if I— I am, I am not afraid to tell, and I wasn't afraid to think, either. I looked it in the face. I wasn't going to run away. At first, at night, if it hadn't been for those fellows, I might have— No, by heavens, I was not going to give them that satisfaction. They had done enough. They made up a story, and believed it, for all I know. But I knew the truth, and I would live it down, alone, with myself— I wasn't going to give in to such a beastly, unfair thing. What did it prove, after all? I was confoundedly cut up, sick of life, to tell you the truth, but what would have been the good to shirk it in—in—that way? 
that was not the way. I believe, I believe it would have, it would have ended nothing. He had been walking up and down, but with the last word he turned short at me. What do you believe? he asked with violence. A pause ensued, and suddenly I felt myself overcome by a profound and hopeless fatigue, as though his voice had startled me out of a dream of wandering through empty spaces whose immensity had harassed my soul and exhausted my body. "'Would have ended nothing,' he muttered over me obstinately after a little while. "'No, the proper thing was to face it out, alone for myself. Wait for another chance. Find out.'" End of chapter 11 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 12 All around everything was still as far as the ear could reach. The mist of his feeling shifted between us as if disturbed by his struggles, and in the rifts of the immaterial veil he would appear to my staring eyes distinctive form and pregnant with vague appeal, like a symbolic figure in a picture. The chill air of the night seemed to lie on my limbs as heavy as a slab of marble. "'I see,' I murmured, more to prove to myself that I could break my state of numbness than for any other reason. "'The Avondale picked us up just before sunset,' he remarked moodily, "'steamed right straight for us. We had only to sit and wait. After a long interval, he said, they told their story. And again there was that oppressive silence. Then only I knew what it was I had made up my mind to, he added. You said nothing, I whispered. What could I say? he asked in the same low tone. Shock slight. Stop the ship. Ascertain the damage took measures to get the boats on without creating a panic. As the first boat was lowered, the ship went down in a squall, sank like lead. What could be more clear? He hung his head, and more awful. His lips quivered while he looked straight into my eyes. I had jumped, hadn't I? he asked, dismayed. That's what I had to live down. The story didn't matter. He clasped his hands for an instant, glanced right and left into the gloom. It was like cheating the dead, he stammered. And there were no dead, I said. He went away from me at this. That is the only way I can describe it. In a moment I saw his back close to the balustrade. He stood there for some time, as if admiring the purity and the peace of the night. Some flowering shrub in the garden below spread its powerful scent through the damp air. He returned to me with hasty steps. "'And that did not matter,' he said, as stubbornly as you please. "'Perhaps not,' I admitted. I began to have the notion that he was too much for me. After all, what did I know? "'Dead or not dead, I could not get clear,' he said. I had to live, hadn't I? Well, yes, if you take it that way, I mumbled. I was glad, of course, he threw out carelessly, with his mind fixed on something else. The exposure, he pronounced slowly, and lifted his head. Do you know what was my first thought when I heard? I was relieved. I was relieved to learn that those shouts— Did I tell you I'd heard shouts? No? Well, I did. Shouts for help, blown along with the drizzle. Imagination, I suppose. And yet I can hardly— How stupid. The others did not. I, I asked them afterwards. They all said no. No? And I was hearing them even then. I might have known. But I didn't think. I only listened. Very faint screams. Day after day— then that little half-caste chap here came up and spoke to me. The Patna, French gunboat, towed successfully to Aden. Investigation, marine office, sailor's home, 
arrangements made for your board and lodging. I walked along with him, and I enjoyed the silence. So there had been no shouting. Imagination. I had to believe him. I could hear nothing more. I wonder how long I could have stood it. It was getting worse, too. I mean, louder. He fell into thought. And I had heard nothing. Well, so be it. But the lights, the lights did go. We did not see them. They were not there. If they had been, I would have swam back. I would have gone back and shouted alongside. I would have begged them to take me on board. I would have had my chance. You doubt me? How do you know how I felt? What right have you to doubt? I very nearly did it as it was. Do you understand? His voice fell. There was not a glimmer. Not a glimmer, he protested mournfully. Don't you understand that if there had been, you would not have seen me here? You see me, and you doubt. I shook my head negatively. This question of the lights being lost sight of when the boat could not have been more than a quarter of a mile from the ship was a matter for much discussion. Jim stuck to it that there was nothing to be seen after the first shower had cleared away, and the others had affirmed the same thing to the officers of the Avondale. Of course people shook their heads and smiled. One old skipper who sat near me in court tickled my ear with his white beard to murmur, "'Of course they would lie.' As a matter of fact, nobody lied, not even the chief engineer, with his story of the masthead light dropping like a match you throw down, not consciously, at least. A man with his liver in such a state might very well have seen a floating spark in the corner of his eye, when stealing a hurried glance over his shoulder. They had seen no light of any sort, though they were well within range, and they could only explain this in one way. The ship had gone down. It was obvious and comforting. The foreseen fact, coming so swiftly, had justified their haste. No wonder they did not cast about for any other explanation. Yet the true one was very simple, and as soon as Briarly suggested it, the court ceased to bother about the question. If you remember, the ship had been stopped, and was lying with her head on the course steered through the night, with her stern canted high and her bows brought low in the water through the filling of the fore compartment. Being thus out of trim, when the squall struck her a little on the quarter, she swung her head to wind as sharply as though she had been at anchor. By this change in her position all her lights were in a very few moments shut off from the boat to the leeward. It may very well be that, had they been seen, they would have had the effect of a mute appeal that their glimmer lost in the darkness of the cloud uh, would have had the mysterious power of the human glance that can awaken the feelings of remorse and pity. It would have said, I am here, still here, and what more can the eye of the most forsaken human being say? But she turned her back on them as if in disdain of their fate. She had swung round, burdened, to glare stubbornly at the new danger of the open sea, which she so strangely survived to the end of her days in a breaking-up yard, as if it had been her recorded fate to die obscurely under the blows of many hammers. What were the various ends their destiny provided for the pilgrims I am unable to say, but the immediate future brought at about nine o'clock the next morning, a French gunboat homeward bound from Réunion. The report of her commander was public property. He had swept a little out of his course to ascertain what was the matter with that steamer floating dangerously by the head upon a still and hazy sea. There was an ensign, Union Down, flying at her main gaff. The serang had the sense to make a signal of distress at daylight. But the cooks were preparing the food in the cooking-boxes forward as usual. The decks were packed as close as a sheep-pen. There were people perched all along the rails, jammed on the bridge in a solid mass. Hundreds of eyes stared, and not a sound was heard when the gunboat ranged abreast, as if all that multitude of lips had been sealed by a spell. The Frenchman hailed, could get no intelligible reply, 
and after ascertaining through his binoculars that the crowd on deck did not look plague-stricken, decided to send a boat. Two officers came on board, listened to the serang, tried to talk with the Arab, couldn't make head or tail of it, but of course the nature of the emergency was obvious enough. They were also very much struck by discovering a white man, dead and curled up peacefully on the bridge. Fort entregue par ce cadavre, as I was informed a long time after by an elderly French lieutenant whom I came across one afternoon in Sydney, by the merest chance in a sort of café, who remembered the affair perfectly. Indeed, this affair, I may notice in passing, had an extraordinary power of defying the shortness of memories and the length of time. It seemed to live with a sort of uncanny vitality in the minds of men, on the tips of their tongues. I've had the questionable pleasure of meeting it often, years afterwards, thousands of miles away, emerging from the remotest possible talk, coming to the surface of the most distant allusions— has it not turned up to-night between us? And I am the only seaman here. I am the only one to whom it is a memory, and yet it has made its way out. But if two men who, unknown to each other, knew of this affair, met accidentally on any spot of this earth, the thing would pop up between them as sure as fate before they parted. I had never seen that Frenchman before, and at the end of an hour we had done with each other for life. He did not seem particularly talkative, either. He was a quiet, massive chap with a creased uniform, sitting drowsily over a tumbler half full of some dark liquid. His shoulder-straps were a bit tarnished, his clean-shaved cheeks were large and sallow. He looked like a man who would be given to taking snuff, don't you know? I won't say he did, but the habit would have fitted that kind of man." It all began by his handing me a number of the home news, which I didn't want, across the marble table. I said, Merci. We exchanged a few apparently innocent remarks, and suddenly, before I knew how it had come about, we were in the midst of it, and he was telling me how much they had been intrigued by that corpse. It turned out he had been one of the boarding officers. In the establishment where we sat, one could get a variety of foreign drinks, which were kept for the visiting naval officers, and he took a sip of the dark, medical-looking stuff, which probably was nothing more nasty than cassis à l'eau, and glancing with one eye into the tumbler, shook his head slightly. "'Impossible de comprendre, vous concevez he said, with a curious mixture of unconcern and thoughtfulness. I could very easily conceive how impossible it had been for them to understand. Nobody in the gunboat knew enough English to get hold of the story as told by the serang. There was a good deal of noise, too, round the two officers. They crowded upon us. There was a circle round that dead man, autour de ce mort, he described. One had to attend to the most pressing. These people were beginning to agitate themselves, parbleu, a mob like that, uh, don't you see? He interjected with philosophic indulgence. As to the bulkhead, he had advised his commander that the safest thing was to leave it alone. It was so villainous to look at. They got two hawsers on board promptly, en total and took the patna in tow, stern foremost at that, which, under the circumstances, was not so foolish, since the rudder was too much out of the water to be of any great use for steering, and this manoeuvre eased the strain on the bulkhead, whose state, he expounded with stolid glibness, demanded the greatest care, exige les plus grands managements. I could not help thinking that my new acquaintance must have had a voice in most of these arrangements. He looked a reliable officer, no longer very active, and he was seamanlike, too, in a way, though as he sat there, with his thick fingers clasped lightly on his stomach, he reminded you of one of those snuffy, quiet village priests, into whose ears are poured the sins, the sufferings, the remorse of peasant generations, 
on whose faces the placid and simple expression is like a veil thrown over the mystery of pain and distress. He ought to have had a threadbare black soutane buttoned smoothly up to his ample chin, instead of a frock-coat with shoulder-straps and brass buttons. His broad bosom heaved regularly, while he went on telling me that it had been the very devil of a job, as doubtless, sans doubt, I could figure to myself in my quality of a seaman, en votre qualité de marin. At the end of the period he inclined his body slightly towards me, and, pursing his shaved lips, allowed the air to escape with a gentle hiss. Luckily, he continued, the sea was level like this table, and there was no more winds than there is here. The place struck me as indeed intolerably stuffy and very hot. My face burned as though I had been young enough to be embarrassed and blushing. They had directed their course, he pursued, to the nearest English port, naturellement, where their responsibility ceased, Dieu merci. He blew out his flat cheeks a little. "'Because, mind you, notez bien, all the time of towing we had two quartermasters stationed with axes by the hawsers to cut us clear of our tow in case she... Uh, he fluttered downward his heavy eyelids, making his meaning as plain as possible. "'What would you? One does what one can. En fait ce qu'on peut.' and, for the moment, he managed to invest his ponderous immobility with an air of resignation. Two quartermasters, thirty hours, always there. Two, he repeated, lifting his right hand a little, and exhibiting two fingers. This was absolutely the first gesture I saw him make. It gave me the opportunity to note a starred scar on the back of his hand, effect of a gunshot, clearly. And, as if my sight had been made more acute by this discovery, I perceived also the seam of an old wound beginning a little below the temple, and going out of sight under the short grey hair at the side of his head, the graze of a spear or the cut of a sabre. He clasped his hands on his stomach again. I remained on board that, uh, that, ah, uh, my memory is going, sans va. Ah, Patna, c'est bien ça. Patna, merci. It is droll how one forgets. I stayed on that ship thirty hours. You did? I exclaimed. Still gazing at his hands, he pursed his lips a little, but this time made no hissing sound. It was judged proper, he said, lifting his eyebrows dispassionately, that one of the officers— should remain to keep an eye open, poor ouvrier le. He sighed idly, and for communicating by signals with the towing ship, do you see, and so on. For the rest, it was my opinion, too. We made our boats ready to drop over, and I also on that ship took measures. Enfin, one has done one's possible. It was a delicate position. Thirty hours. They prepared me some food. As for the wine, go and whistle for it. Not a drop. In some extraordinary way, without any marked change in his inert attitude and the placid expression of his face, he managed to convey the idea of profound disgust. I, you know, when it comes to eating without my glass of wine, I am nowhere. I was afraid he would enlarge upon the grievance, for though he didn't stir a limb or twitch a feature, he made one aware how much he was irritated by the recollection. But he seemed to forget all about it. They delivered their charge to the port authorities, as he expressed it. He was struck by the calmness with which it had been received. One might have thought they had such a droll find, droll de trouvé, brought them every day. "'You are extraordinary, you others,' he commented, with his back propped against the wall, and looking himself as incapable of an emotional display as a sack of meal. There happened to be a man-of-war and in an Indian marine steamer in the harbour at the time, 
and he did not conceal his admiration of the efficient manner in which the boats of these two ships cleared the patna of her passengers. Indeed, his torpid demeanour concealed nothing. It had that mysterious, almost miraculous power of producing striking effects by means impossible of detection, which is the last word of the highest art. Twenty-five minutes. Watch in hand. Twenty-five. No more. He unclasped and clasped again his fingers, without removing his hands from his stomach, and made it infinitely more effective than if he had thrown up his arms to heaven in amazement. All that lot, to Simon, on shore, with their little affairs, nobody left but a guard of seamen, Marins de la Tarte, and that interesting corpse, cet intéressant cadavre. Twenty-five minutes. With downcast eyes and his head tilted slightly on one side, he seemed to roll knowingly on his tongue the savour of a smart bit of work. He persuaded one, without any further demonstration, that his approval was eminently worth having, and, resuming his hardly interrupted immobility, went on to inform me that, being under orders to make the best of their way to Toulon, they left in two hours' time. So that, de Sorque, there are many things in this incident of my life, dans ces épisodes de ma vie, which have remained obscure. End of chapter 12